Exactly. Uh, I did have a bunch of people watch the recording from our last meeting, so I will be uh, recording that again. So uh, let's, uh, we'll go ahead and start, John. You want to do an introduction and we'll uh, kind of get sure. going. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. And th thanks for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule to be with us. The Pennsylvania State Association of Township Commissioners um, really has, has seen a need, as we all know, um, in local government and, and, and our fire service um, and how we provide that in a, in a changing and evolving world. Um, and I, I think we all agree that there's not one solution, there's a variety of solutions. And thanks to Jerry and his leadership with the, with, with the Institute, um, we're proud to partner to bring this, this um, um, series on the evolution of fire service in Pennsylvania uh, to life. Um, we're not going to finish in October. This issue is not going away. Um, so one of the one of the things we'd like to do, and we'll be in touch with you all, uh, really forming a you know a, 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 a really a committee, a, I don't say a steering committee, but really an advisory committee that can help one another out. Whether you be an elected official, a township manager, a fire official, um, you know we're all in this together, and you know we understand that there's you know so oftentimes some um, um, you know issues that that we need to resolve that are unique to our regions, but there's a common fabric in all of our communities that that you know we're here for a reason we're here because we're passionate about our communities and we want to do the right thing so uh, thank you um, I have the opportunity to be uh, second vice president I'm also on council here in Wilkesbury Township in Luzerne County um, and have the opportunity to work with Jerry on on, on this uh, very important webinar series Jerry thank you and welcome all right uh, we'll very quickly go uh, go around the room uh, and uh, just kind of do a brief introduction of uh, uh, who you are where you're from and uh, We'll start with Denise. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for having this second uh, session. Denise Kuritz, Lower Moreland Township is Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, Montgomery County. Lower Moreland Township Commissioner. Thanks again. Very good. Thanks, Denise. Uh, Doug, go Doug will be next. Good evening, everybody. I'm Doug Okenauer. I'm the fire administrator for uh, Hampton Township, Cumberland uh, County. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Jim Childs is next. Uh, I'm Jim Childs. I'm the uh, fire marshal for Darby Township, which is located in Delaware County. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Nate Silcox. Thanks, Jerry. Nate Silcox, Hampton Township Commissioner, as well as a uh, uh, immediate past president of the state association. And John, thanks for putting this together. And Jerry, uh, thanks for presenting. Thanks, Nate. Uh, Ed Glassman. Ed Glassman. I'm the fire chief in Upper Moreland Township in Montgomery County. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Catherine. Catherine Carter. Hello. Uh, thank you for having this next session. I am Catherine Carter from Upper Gwinnett Township. I'm a township commissioner in Montgomery County. Thank you. Ray. Ray Lonnebach, a fire marshal for Tinicum Township, Delaware County, and I'm also the treasurer for the Tinicum Township Fire Company. Thank you, Ray. A look. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Alok Padnik. I'm from Salisbury Township, Lehigh County. I'm a township commissioner as well as a volunteer firefighter. Thank you for setting this up. Thank you. Uh, Joshua. Joshua Wells from Western Salisbury in Salisbury Township, uh, fire chief of finishing my 10th year and 25 years as a volunteer. Dave Hall. Hey, Jerry and everybody. Dave Hall, I'm the uh, public safety director for Lower Allen Township in uh, Cumberland County. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Tim, Timothy. Tim Shuck, I'm the Fire Service Administrator for Upper Dublin Township in Montgomery County. Thank you. Uh, Tom, next up, Tom Foran. Hey, good evening, everybody. Tom Foran, Deputy Chief, the Springfield Fire Company in Delco. Thank you. Kevin Smith. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Smith. I am the Deputy Fire Chief for Butler Township Volunteer Fire District in Butler County. Thank you. Keith Thomas. All right, we'll get back to Keith. Uh, Kenneth Felker. 
Ken Felker, Assistant Fire Chief, Springfield Fire Company, Delaware County. Thank you. Dustin Grove. Dustin Grove, Salisbury Township, uh, Fire Services Director, oh, Lea County. So Thank you. Matthew. Uh, Matt Canlin, Township Manager, Upper Morning Township, Montgomery County. Thank you. Jason. Jason Singer, Town of McAnlis. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Amy Sturgis. Good evening, everyone. My camera's not working this evening, but good evening. Um, Amy Sturgis, Deputy Executive Director for Advocacy for the League and PSATC. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Liz. Liz. Hi, Liz McNaney from uh, Commissioner from Upper Glen Township in Montgomery County. Okay, thank you very much. Did I miss anybody? All righty, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'll keep monitoring the screen to see if uh, anybody else comes up on the screen. I just wanted to confirm everybody could see the slides, correct? John, is everybody yes. good with the slides? Great. Yep. Th yep. That's good. Thank you very much. Uh, here's our agenda for tonight. Um, excuse me if my dog decides to, uh, or two dogs decide to bark behind me, but I'm kind of fly flying solo tonight as my wife is out uh, preparing for the weekend and getting things ready. We have a family get together this weekend. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about, uh, well, we're going to talk about modern methods of recruitment and retention. Okay. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk about the transition from volunteer to combination and some of the pieces that go with that. And then we're gonna talk about some of the regionalization efforts that have occurred in Pennsylvania. And again, like I mentioned before, um, like I mentioned before, I, I am uh, just a small piece of the, the pie in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things. And uh, I do a ton of research. Uh, I, I do a, a lot of traveling to learn about what's going on in Pennsylvania. And uh, obviously we've had some issues over the last couple of weeks. There's some issues uh, in two different townships in Pennsylvania where there's some conflict between the municipality and uh, uh, the volunteer fire company. And if you're interested in learning a little bit about that, you know, all you have to do is uh, do a Google search for uh, Toby Hanna Township is one and uh, Walker Township is the other. And you can read a little bit about that. Uh, I was uh, interviewed by a, uh, a newspaper and, and uh, I'll try to discuss some of the issues that, uh, that are happening. And, and it's one of those things that continues to happen across Pennsylvania when there's a breakdown in communication between a fire company and the local government. Now, this program, again, is not specifically designed for that. There's other programs that are specifically designed for that uh, that, that kind of get that process started. But I just wanted you to be aware of that because every couple of months across Pennsylvania, these things, these things creep up and uh, we, we get involved in, in trying to you know, move forward with that. So um, primarily Pennsylvania is a volunteer state. Uh, when you look at the history of the fire service in Pennsylvania, when you look at what, uh, what has been going on, uh, how we were established, and we talked a little bit about that from the Ben Franklin days, to the expansion in the 1950s and 1960s and, and, and things like that, uh, we are primarily a volunteer state. And, and again, as I mentioned before, we are primarily mostly nonprofit 501c3 corporations. However, there's been a transition over a period of time in different areas in Pennsylvania where municipalities have become more involved in the fire service. As you know, most of the cities uh, some of the townships have always had some sort of paid fire service, but uh, primarily, uh, primary, and, and that would be part of government, primarily, uh, we've been focusing on, for the past 30 years, on the improving our ability to recruit and retain new members, okay, and, and making sure our departments are healthy. Uh, I have worked uh, for a couple of different organizations over the last couple of years, and, and I've done some uh, training on volunteer recruitment. I've been involved working with organizations. Um, 
And, and you know, there's some trends that are occurring across Pennsylvania. And those trends, again, uh, and I have spoke about this in the past is, you know, in some areas of Pennsylvania, the population is getting older, okay? The population is getting older. Um, you know, youth today, you know, there is a perception that youth do not want to volunteer. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the, the statement, uh, you know, my, my, one of my mentors and I put these slides together. He's from down in, uh, down in uh, the, the uh, Montgomery County area. And him and I did a presentation on this uh, statewide, but he's seeing some trends because he grew up in Western Pennsylvania and some of the challenges that he faced, um, the challenge of fundraising, okay? Fundraising demands of volunteer fire companies are still there, okay? One of the statements that we have to accept in today's world is that training takes a long time to complete. Uh, may, maybe some of you that have been involved in training understand that uh, the dynamics of training has, uh, has changed over the past 30, 35 years when it was initially 45 hours essentials of firefighting. Now it's you know, close to 180, 200 hours to get all that stuff. And uh, it does take a long time to complete. And I can explain when I'm challenged about training requirements, I can explain exactly exactly why those training requirements have changed. Uh, but there is a lot of perception out there that uh, training is one of the big problems. However, when I do talk to fire chiefs, when I talk to uh, fire organizations that, that believe in training and want to move forward, they completely understand and they completely believe in the concept of training. Again, we talked before about changing performance standards, okay? Uh, you know, uh, and the demographic and the intergenerational challenges of today's fire departments, the expectations of long-term members versus the youth that are getting in departments. And this is very similar trends in the workforce. You know, many people uh, you remember back in the day where, where you joined in the workforce and you stayed at the same organization for 35 years. Uh, that's not the same with, uh, with uh, the workforce of today. And that's the same with volunteer organizations. We see people come into the organization, they stay for a period of time, they move away and, and, and they start, they may start back over again. And the reason why we're starting to talk about volunteers is all of you have to assess your current organization and your capacity to bring in volunteers. What does your community look like? What proactive methods are going, are, are going to do that? Because again, there is some places and there's some organizational philosophies that, that say we're done. You know, we don't have the ability to recruit anymore. Our community uh, wants a different standard. We've decided to, to move in a different direction and things like that. So those of you that are municipal leaders, those of you that are, are municipal managers, elected officials, um, and, and, and chiefs that are in the room, you have to kind of figure that out with it, with, with, with it, it's in your in your municipality. So here's what you need to do, okay? When you start to assess your volunteer needs. Now we spoke before last week on that concept of an effective firefighting force. And, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that are going on. But what you need to kind of find out right now, if you don't have these numbers off the top of your head, okay? Before you recruit, you need to clearly identify what you need, okay? And that number, that first second bullet point there is that concept of an interior firefighter. And what we call that is, some people call it SCBA qualified, some people call it whatever, you know, each fire department, fire chief in Pennsylvania has the authority to, in their own department, to say, you could go into a structure fire. And that is the most high risk environment that we have, okay? We're putting on all this gear. They could go into a building when the house is burning, okay? And, you know, the chief, there's a roster of members. There's a roster of members, okay? And there's some departments uh, that, that do their annual test, you know, an SCBA check, 
Uh, some departments require that a, fire, a firefighter becomes a firefighter one, which is the training and certification aspects, okay, before they become SCBA qualified. Some fire departments in Pennsylvania uh, only want the member to complete the interior module, you know, up to the interior module and not certified, okay? But you need that number when you as, how many people can go in a fire, okay? The next classification of membership is that exterior support member or a driver, okay? Because there are certain members that are either in the training process, okay? Or for a some physical, a, some physical issue, I don't wanna say that's, that's not the right term to use, but they are not, they don't wanna go into a structure fire, okay? They wanna join the volunteer fire department uh, they want to put the gear on and maybe they want to help outside of the structure. Or there are certain members that kind of reach an age or their physical abilities, they don't want to do that, okay? And they either become a driver in the organization, a fire truck driver, a ladder truck driver, an engine driver, or something like that. So there's interior qualified firefighters. Now, again, no state standard in this. It's your local standard or what you determine that to be and exterior firefighters. So you should have a good idea on, for your needs assessment, how many of you have in your organization. Total number, and then when are those members are available? Okay, when you, when are they available? Because some of your, your members, you know, they're work, if they work full-time jobs, they're not gonna be in your community, okay? And, and you're relying on other mutual aid or whatever. The next category that is a very important category that I believe are what's called fire police. Now, some municipalities have fire police, some do not. I've been to areas in whole counties in Pennsylvania where they don't have fire police. And fire police provide incident scene safety and traffic incident management. And um, those, those personally, I believe they're a very valuable part of the Pennsylvania Fire Service. They're specific training and they are not police officers for those of you that are municipal officials. They do not carry weapons. They do not, you know, they have a little badge, but they do not, they have no enforcement at all. They are incident scene safety. Like if we had a house fire, the fire police would keep the public back and, you know, they would set up their traffic control units and same things like that. The second, or the, the next category is administrative members, administrative members. And every volunteer fire department that I know has some sort of administrative membership category, or some of them call them social participating members, but it depends on your complexity. An administrative member could be a member that, uh, that serves in uh, a role such as a treasurer that doesn't want to go on calls or, or is not interested in that, a secretary of the organization. Okay, somebody to handle the social committee. And then there's social participating members, you know, people that help with fundraising and things like that. So one of the benchmarks or one of the things that you as officials should know is year to year, is these numbers going up or are these numbers going down? What does that look like? And what does our trends look like over time? And not only the, the whole number, uh, because each one of those members, because we use recording, we have, we have software that, you know, you could see how active some of these members are because, uh, you know, my, 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 my personal feeling, um, there's some departments in Pennsylvania, again, in my, in my assessment, there's usually a handful of people holding the place together. There's about five people that are running 50 to 60% of the calls, and then you've got a couple you know, and, and, and then there's that concept. You don't, when you're at, you as municipal officials want to ask a question, don't use the word, you can, you know, something, well, how many active versus inactive and all that gets too confusing. Uh, how many interior qualified members are, but how, how many of those interior firefighters have run at least 10% of the calls last year? Uh, so that, that, that I, I cannot stress as much to you as this, that you got to know what your current work, your volunteer workforce looks like right now, okay? Now, again, if somebody has a question, you can always raise your hand with the uh, Zoom function and John will monitor that. I do not mind if you guys break in and ask a question during the session. Next concept up, okay? 
if you want to be successful at recruiting members, okay, it must be constant. There has to be a culture within the organization that believes in recruitment and that you are actively seeking members, okay? If the fire chief comes in and says, we're done recruiting, it's not worth it anymore, you know, that's not gonna work because the fire chief is an extremely important position in our organizations, extremely important. And if they don't believe in it, you know, the organizational momentum will be on something else. But I could, I could tell you it needs to be constant. You need to have a process to bring those members in. You need to have a process to bring those members in. And it, it, it's got to be, a, 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 I want to call it as least a hassle as possible, okay? Uh, getting them as part of the organization. And that's one of those challenges that I've seen in Pennsylvania with some volunteer organizations not modernizing their onboarding process. Well, say somebody gets in, your shows interest. Uh, they got to fill out this 50 page form. They got to be read at this meeting. Then they got to come back the next meeting. Then they got to do this, that. You got to figure out a way to make that a little more easier because you don't want to lose the interest of that volunteer. Okay. You don't want to lose that interest of the volunteer. Again, this is high level stuff that I'm going to be talking with you tonight. There are more classes and get into, get into a lot more detail on doing this the right way. There's a lot of national programs to the National Volunteer Fire Council and the International Association of Fire Chiefs Combination and Volunteer Section. They, they got a lot of good stuff on this recruitment piece. So you got recruitment, you got recruitment, and then you got retention. Okay, you got, and then again, I talked to members and maybe I should have put the retention slide first. Okay, but I always, because I'm old school in some ways, I always say recruitment, then retention. Some of my colleagues always do retention first. A lot of Pennsylvania departments that have the capabilities have begun, be, have started these, what I call innovative, some innovative retention efforts. Okay, innovative retention efforts. Okay. And I'm going to go through these in a little bit of detail, okay, a little bit of detail, because, uh, again, some places, you know, again, this is a, for retention efforts to work, you have to ask the volunteers, what, what's, what would they like to see? Because, you know, me at an executive level, you know, it's my idea. It might not be the same idea uh, as an 18, 19, 20-year-old or a 32-year-old. When your organization is working on these types of incentive programs, okay, these types of incentive programs, you got to ask the members. So based on uh, me working with uh, my mentor, working with a couple other people, learning from national level programs, the list on the right is some of the, some of the retention efforts that are going into uh, volunteer service uh, today. Okay, across Pennsylvania. Every one of these retention efforts um, costs money. Okay. And the challenge that we have across Pennsylvania is many departments are barely making it now uh, and they don't have the money to start any of these. That's why some of the grant programs and stuff I think are very valuable for departments that really want to do this. We do a great job in Pennsylvania buying a lot of stuff, but investing back into our members. So again, I've seen departments across Pennsylvania, a stipend for training certificates, okay? You make it up to Firefighter One. I have seen departments in Pennsylvania after that accomplishment is reached, uh, that member is presented a check for $1,000, okay? Right before Christmas. If once they did that. And again, one of those things and the concept that that chief told me is that uh, volunteer spouse has uh, accepted that that person will be away out of the home for close to 200 hours of training. And what we can do for them is here's a, here's a thousand dollars. Okay. Gift cards out of area training. I have seen a lot of departments uh, pay for training to national level conferences to get excellent training 
uh, different types of other types of programs. I've seen departments with uh, resident housing programs. There's a there's a there's there's quite a few resident housing programs or live-in programs. Cell phone stipends, um, tuition re reimbursement programs, leadership development programs. There's uh, stipends for line officers because again, the complexity of running our organizations today. Okay. Um, and, and again, when I talk about complexity, when you look at your community and you benchmark it against something, now, and, and there's a difference in complexity of, a, of an area that has a population of 1,200 citizens, you may have a few commercial property, you know, your volunteer fire company is probably going to be running about 150 calls, okay? But you jump into a township that's got 30,000 people, okay? Uh, with a lot of industry and a lot of other things, your call volume is going to be 700, 800, 900 calls. To keep that going as an all-volunteer organization requires tons of administrative and hours. And, and some people have, some organizations have developed uh, line officer stipends for taking a line officer positions. The length of service award programs or the retirement or, or, or a, a mini retirement program, they've been around for 30 years in Pennsylvania. I've heard about that. Act 172, the municipal tax credits, Act 91, the county and school district tax credits. We're getting some traction on every single one of those. Okay. We have one county in Pennsylvania, Cumberland County, that's, at, that's done Act 91 with a $250 property tax credit. We've got York County is talking about it. We have about three or four school districts that have implemented a $250 tax credit. Uh, I don't have the exact number on the municipal tax credit. Um, you could do that uh, up to $500 uh, on uh, EIT, uh, earned income tax, and uh, I think up to 100% on property taxes. And as I mentioned last time, there's, an, or there's a township up in the Poconos that does a, a 100% uh, uh, for that. So again, you need to think through this. That does cost money. Uh, but uh, again, if your vision is to keep this volunteer department, a volunteer department in the future, investing in these retention efforts, uh, is, is, it, it, it appears nationally that this is what this is what there is. Okay, this is what's out there. And if any of you have seen anything different, please send a, a message into the uh, chat room or something like that, and I could add it to my list. Okay. All right. Um, it is a local thing. Okay. Recruitment and retention is local. We could do some regional programs, and we're going to talk about it. But it is that moment that that person walks into the firehouse, okay, and somebody introduces them, okay, and that, you know, you know, you need, you need someone in that organization to commit to being that recruiter, that, that membership committee chairperson. And I've just recently seen that in my department over the past couple of years, when somebody's invested in it and somebody is in charge of it and really wants to do a good job, okay? Um, I, I, I've seen positive success. So Keith just sent a question in and what have I seen on pay per call? Okay, pay per call. I have seen more pay per call outside of Pennsylvania. I, I, I have seen, uh, I did work uh, for VFIS. Many of you guys know uh, VFIS is a national insurance company. Uh, I did four years and I traveled in Washington State, California, uh, did a lot of work in Colorado, uh, Louisiana, and uh, New England, and I saw more paper call, uh, paper call in, in that organization, in that area. I don't, I don't see too much of that in Pennsylvania. Not that it's not happening. It could be happening. I just don't know of a good example of that just yet. It could be happening. Um, and, and there's some, some things to follow, and I'll, I'll show, you, uh, show you about that, uh, the, the concepts uh, on that paper call. Uh, thanks for the question on that. You know, somebody in charge of recruitment and retention, very important, and that's their task, okay? That's their task. That's what they need to do. Recruitment is marketing, okay? Recruitment is marketing. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, 
is there an incentive to somebody become a, to, to, that they want to, you know, are they joining the organization to get, a, to get a tax credit? Are they joining the organization because they work in a job uh, where, you know, they have a position and maybe they're not happy in their position and they want to join the volunteer fire service because it's something meaningful to give back to the community. And I have met numerous volunteers over my career that just, you know, they got a job, they need a job, they, that's what they need to pay their mortgage and their car loans and their kids to college. But what their passion is, is being a volunteer fireman, okay? And they love that kind of stuff. But know what those members want. And, and finally, that, that, that bullet point at the bottom there is you got to really have that vision uh, and, and that the leadership of the organization's got to say, we're committed to this, okay? Because the minute you've got, as I mentioned already, the leadership saying, this is done, we're not going to do it, and, and, and that's it, it's over, uh, or it's not going to be a priority. Uh, I've got some personal examples of that over the years, but I, I do really think that it is a, uh, you know, it, it is critical uh, that, that it, it, is a, it is a positive thing in your volunteer world. So um, that's that local individual department recruitment effort. Okay, and, and many of you on this, on this webinar maybe have done that. Um, again, it's an option. There's some people that have done regional recruitment efforts, and I'll highlight some of those. Okay, uh, the Keystone Firefighters Initiative uh, the Keystone Firefighters Initiative was in Blair and Cambria County. There are 40 departments that were part of that. Their most popular, um, they, it was a marketing campaign. And this is a federal grant that, that uh, paid for this. They're, and again, it's the typical marketing, a website, a lot of social media, things like that. Okay. But then the most, um, uh, you know, then the most, most, the most, uh, uh, what they told me in that grant was the most popular piece of the retention effort was the stipend, the pay stipend, that if you ran so many calls, you got a cash stipend. Uh, that was, what was that one? The next one is the Capital Area Council of Governments. Uh, I'm part of the CAPCOG Safety Committee, and this was a, an effort that started about, about six years ago. Uh, we have 20 municipalities with 21 volunteer fire departments as part of it across the uh, Dauphin County, Cumberland County, and Lebanon County. Uh, the goal for the grant was to get 50 firefighters a year over for four years. Um, and that, 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 that grant program, uh, you know, is very positive. Uh, I, we're only, we are only eight months into it, okay? We've gotten some good traction on it. It was, it was funded by, uh, by FEMA. Okay, that's a number that what you're looking at is if you decide to do some sort of grant program, that, that's a number for the grant writer, about 4,500. Uh, and I guess there's some grant writers that do a couple things differently. And you know, there's a couple of them uh, that do it across Pennsylvania. But to be honest with you, you've got to have a vision and you got to have champions to make it happen. Okay, because people can get in these regional efforts People can get distracted very easily with um, all the things that are going on in the world, okay, and in your community. You got to have a vision. You got to move toward it. And again, when a lot of municipalities and a lot of different organizations are thinking they need to hire career firefighters and move in that, in that direction, you got to try a recruitment program first. And if it doesn't, and that's my opinion, Jerry's opinion does not have to be your philosophy, Try it, see what happens. So this regional grant program, again, uh, one of the key pieces that I, again, I recommend is including funds in the grant for a program manager. Because if you ask already taxed volunteers to manage a million dollar grant program, okay, because again, there's reporting requirements with the federal government, there's performance reports that need to be done. There's a lot of pieces and parts that move, you know, it's a little hard when, when you're already, you're, you're, you're already cord, you're already having trouble doing things and you're asked to do the grant program. Uh, some people uh, also have a, an, an even departmental grant programs. Okay, they're in Franklin County, which is about an hour south of where I live. 
one of the fire departments got a safer grant to pay for stipend programs for daylight drivers, okay? And they also included in their, their stipend program for daylight drivers is they included a uh, like a fifteen thousand dollar I think a year, uh, p maybe it was less than that. I got to look into that for their deputy chief to manage the program because in the, when you're managing schedules uh, and things like that, there's a hassle factor in there that uh, you know it's something above and beyond being your normal volunteer. You should be reimbursed for that. We interviewed marketing firms as part of this regional effort, okay? Uh, there's a variety of different marketing firms that are out there. Most of these regional recruitment efforts uh, have some sort of website and social media. And we do also recommend that each volunteer fire department have a leader or a coordinator in each department, okay? So there is a contact in that. So. I'm going to be able to communicate after we get a year under our belt of the four year program, I'll, I'll be able to communicate better outcomes to you on this. Um, I, I, I like the uh, momentum on it. I like the effort to it. Um, but we will see. We are going to continue to do that. Um, I do encourage you all to, uh, you know, here's the here's the marketing piece out of it. OK, it's a pretty good marketing piece. We had these are actual pictures of. Uh, you know, firefighters from the capital region, there's tons of pictures, there's videos, there's a whole bunch of things on that website. Um, again, I've, I've been asked, uh, you know, by municipalities that have like, uh, there's an example of one asked me that they have four separate fire companies in, in uh, their municipality. And uh, they wanted to do one of these programs, uh, not this one, this is something different, by the way. And they couldn't come to a consensus with the four departments. One of them did not want to participate. And I said, you know, it's a little hard to do a township wide recruitment campaign when one of them don't want to participate, because what if somebody that lives close to that station that doesn't want to participate comes in through that? All those questions need to be answered. So the regional recruitment grant, there's a marketing piece. OK, there's a marketing piece. There's money for turnout gear for each new member that comes in. There's money for a physical for every new member that comes in and you're required to get your gear. You got to get a physical to start your training. You got to get a physical because this is federal money, okay, federal money, federal money requires, uh, because again, the grant guidance that comes from the, the seven national organizations and one of those national organizations uh, you know, is, is NFPA and they want to make sure that which makes good sense that we're not bringing someone in an organization that has you know, an undiagnosed heart condition and, and things like that. So that's why physicals are very important. There's a life insurance piece to it above and beyond um, the, the current fire department life insurance piece. Trade school or college tuition reimbursement. That's one of the retention pieces and a response stipend also. There's a response stipend. So that's the, the totality of that grant. Um, and, and I'm, I'm uh, okay. Um, Dustin sent it to me. Is there a breakdown on where the grant information can be found on these programs? And I will show you that. I will show you that before we're done today. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, because they are, again, uh, there's some people that do them a little bit different. And, and I think it's a good, uh, I think it's a good option for people to run it. Uh, you, you want to be proactive though. And I, I also, Tell departments, uh, you need to work with your local government on this, your municipality, to make sure that they're understanding what's going on, because there has been some places in Pennsylvania that have gotten re, uh, grant programs uh, to help pay for some staffing, and the municipality was either not aware of it or they did not know about it. Uh, or, or there was not a clear definition on when the grant goes away, what happens to the people that are getting uh, some of the grant funds, uh, and there could be some stress in, in, in that. So you have to kind of look at this strategically, look at the grant program strategically, because SAFER not only funds these recruitment programs, retention programs, they also fund hiring of firefighters, hiring of firefighters, and there's a whole process for that also. Here's some of the other countywide programs uh, through their fire chiefs associations that have occurred. 
Um, the, one of the innovative programs in Allegheny County is the Fire Vest program, uh, where if you are a volunteer firefighter, uh, you could, uh, an active volunteer firefighter, uh, you can go to the Community College of Allegheny County at a uh, free tuition for that, uh, for that period. So I know that I've talked to a bunch of people out there. There's some people that have used it in their fire department. And there are some people that have not used it in their departments. So again, looking at a countywide or regionwide or or an individual thing. So um, you know, again, assessing your 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 abilities, assessing assessing what you have. Again, I, I wanted to put this in again. This is this is key. Okay, this is key. If your department has given up on recruitment, the uh, you, you, you are going to be pushing the boulder up the hill. Okay. And maybe that that's, that's okay. Okay. If you've, if you've done it, if you've gone through it and, and things like that, the important thing is again, transforming your, your membership committee into a more proactive recruitment and retention committee. Okay. More proactive recruitment and retention committee. And, and what I do recommend is that you just do not have somebody that's been in the department 25 years on this committee. You need to have somebody that's been in the department two years, uh, five years, 20 years. You need to have a member of the fire police. You need to have a member of the administration on it, uh, a chief officer or a line officer. So it, it doesn't, you know, again, that, that, that group of thinking of positive things <clears throat> Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of the more people involved, the more buy-in, the more buy-in toward that. Um, make it easy to get in. Okay, I did talk a little bit about that. Easier. Okay, you know, uh, outline those expectations. Okay, you know, if your training is on Tuesday nights, um, one of the first things you need to tell that new member is, you know, one of the ways to become successful in this organization is. You need to try to show your face at, uh, you know, on Tuesday night, okay? Conduct an interview uh, with the potential member. Do it before they fill out an application. That's where you talk about those expectations, okay? See if it's for them, okay? The worst thing that you could do is you, you have an old school traditional way of bringing in volunteers, go through the whole process and all that kind of stuff. And it turns out that once they get in, they get their gear, it's not for them. That's a lot of time and effort, okay? That simple onboarding process where, where in today's world, you know, if many, many departments are using I Am Responding or that other app that people have, you know, you could get somebody hooked up on I Am Responding very quickly to get them interested in seeing what's going on. And then having a good mentor to help them uh, navigate becoming part of it you know, be becoming part of the organization. So that's some, some tips and tricks with that. Some tips and tricks with that. So some success stories. Okay. Here's some success stories or some things I put together and my, and then my mentor puts them together. So money, where does some of this come from? So if you take a look, uh, this is the federal safer grants that were distributed to Pennsylvania fire departments in uh, the end of 2021 federal fiscal year and so far starting in 2022. So there'll be more, more that are rolling out, okay, as, as time goes on. So you'll see a mix if you get down, down to the left, okay, down to the left. Um, the second one down is our grant that we have in, in central Pennsylvania here, south central Pennsylvania. You know, that's the regional grant and if you get down a little bit farther, West Manchester Township, uh, they're 462,000. A lot of that is a marketing campaign. A lot of that is a marketing campaign. Um, again, it looks like Montgomery County has gotten one uh, in 2021. Uh, you'll see some individual fire departments for hiring of firefighters. Uh, you'll see some cities in Pennsylvania there when you go to the right. Uh, a borough uh, looks like they just got a, a grant for for uh, for hiring of firefighters. Um, uh, eventually, you know, I will probably reach out to some of these organizations, or if I'll hear a little bit, or I'll do a social media search. 
on on what specifically is it, what specifically do the, do they do now? For example, I do know that Moon Run, Moon Run is in Allegheny County, and they are paying for some sort of stipend staffing program. Okay, uh, I did a program there for the uh, South Hills Cog or something like that, and I was at that station, and they were telling me about that's what they're using that uh, that money for is some sort of staffing of the station program. So all of this federal, this is on a safer, it's the safer grant website. Uh, and it's like I said, how it's spelled. And, and it talks about the grant guide guidelines and, and things like that. Um, that's some of the examples on, on what they are. And, and again, you know, doing your due diligence on this, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, giving one of these departments a call and saying, hey, you know, I just saw you guys got the grant money. Uh, you know, what do you, what's your thought on this? Because obviously they've had to write a, write a narrative on it. They got to have some sort of plan. You got to have some sort of plan on, on what they're doing with it. Now, again, one of the, again, cautions that I, I do want to say, if your department is interested in doing the hiring piece, you, you need to make sure your municipalities are involved or understand that, you know, usually the, the hiring a firefighter grant program is like a three-year program or four years and, and the amount in the grant go down over the years and it's supposed to be replaced by by local money as, as it as it uh, as the federal money goes away how else can we fund recruitment and retention programs in pennsylvania so there's a thing called act 91 uh, which was uh, a couple of years ago uh, there's two other funding sources in pennsylvania from state funds, state funds that could be used to fund recruitment and retention programs. Okay. Again, the, the fire and EMS grant program, and that number uh, is about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year that, that fire companies that apply to that will, will get that grant. Um, there's also fire relief is now permitted to do length of service award programs and recruitment and retention activities. Okay. Uh, those are both eligible expenses. Like any new program, if you would develop some sort of new program, an innovative program, you'd always want to kind of write it up and you send that into the Office of State Fire Commissioner just to make sure that it is uh, an allowable expense. Um, I have also seen local money going into uh, recruitment activities also, local money going into recruitment activities and also. Again, here's just a, a brief list. I'll show you a, a very brief list of what, what, um, what has been done with some of the money, some of the funds through Pennsylvania. This was a specific grant from uh, the Firefighters Association of the state of Pennsylvania. They had a $5,000 grant program for, for any fire department that wants to apply in Pennsylvania. They do still have money. Uh, they do still have money until the end of this year. And I know there's still money available if any of you are interested in it. It could only be used for marketing. Okay, it can only be used for marketing. And again, this department decided to do uh, digital marketing, a digital marketing campaign. Their goal was to recruit high school and college students because they are located near Millersville University. Okay, that was their goal. Okay, specific, you'll see on the marketing effort right there, high school, college students right there. That was a targeted marketing right there. And you'll see their, their outcome. Another one, another fire company, you know, again, focusing on their website, their branding, things like that. There's another fire company that did a couple of different things. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Posters, billboards, newspaper articles, a recruitment video. Again, this was basically easy money. It's a $5,000 $5, grant uh, to, to get out there. And again, there's ways to do this. There's ways to do this uh, as long as you have a vision and a goal to do that. Okay. A, a vision and a goal to, to make that kind of stuff happen. Here's some of the organizations, again, some of the organizations, and again, I will be sending you all of this uh, PowerPoint once, once we're done, some of the organizations. I do wanna give a plug to the Office of the State Fire Commissioner. Uh, the Office of the State Fire Commissioner has stood up a specific section 
on recruitment and retention. They have a manager now of recruitment and retention. Uh, Tracy has a website that is located on the uh, Office of the State Fire Commissioner's uh, webpage, and there's a lot of resources on there. You know, they're still building that office out. Uh, there is funding in the state budget to have some subject matter experts added to that office. And, and the goal of that office is to um, go out into the community, the fire service community and research, benchmark, uh, provide hands-on service. That's the, the best way that I can, uh, that's the best way that I could, that, that, that I could explain to you what, what the vision, they're still, again, they're still working through some of the details on standing that office up. But uh, again, as we as we're you know moving away from that recruitment piece, as we're moving away from that recruitment and retention piece, you know you have to decide, you know what what your vision is for that, and and, and how are we how are we going to um, how are we going to be successful? How how are we going to be successful? Um, anybody ha and again here's the website with a lot of that stuff. Uh, it's BFPA Firefighter. Uh, if you wanted to look on that, there's a, the application to get that. Anybody have any specific questions that they want to send in on the recruitment and the recruitment and retention piece, the recruitment and retention piece? Any specific questions on that? Hey, Jerry, there isn't a central repository of information on you know what what each community is doing. It's, there really isn't anything that's gathered of you know here's one central library or resource of of what's out there, right? John, you are correct, and that that is definitely our challenge. Um, how I find out about this is I, again I, I with federal stuff I kind of look at that every time they release some money from the federal government to see who gets it and what they're doing with it. But no, there, I, I do not believe there is a central repository. It's just kind of seeing what's out there, you know, seeing what, what people are doing. Good question. All righty. So I'm going to move on to the next discussion. Uh, the next discussion um, that moves kind of from, from that, Typical volunteer recruitment program. So, so when we look at systems in Pennsylvania, when we look at systems in Pennsylvania, volunteer and fire systems and other fire systems, um, traditionally, uh, again, most cities had firefighters, paid firefighters. They were sitting at the fire station. When a call would go out, they would be dispatched and they'd go out. Then we have what's called the come from home volunteer model, okay? Uh, the come from home volunteer model where there's an emergency call, you know, your volunteers are out spread out in the community, they're at work, they're at home. Um, they, um, the call is dispatched and they run to the station in their cars. Some of them use blue lights, some of them use red lights. They get into the apparatus and then they, they drive to the scene, okay? Late 70s, early 80s, the concept of a living program started to come up in Pennsylvania. It's actually started in suburban Washington, D.C., in the volunteer fire service in suburban Washington, D.C., and it migrated up to uh, central Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the first live-in programs in the state of Pennsylvania was uh, around the Harrisburg area. And that put volunteers into a station with a, with a specific uh, bunk room. And uh, when there'd be a call, um, that call, we would go out the call, you would be immediately out the door if you had a driver. Sometimes you had to wait for one of those come from home volunteers to get to the station and drive the apparatus. So as the 80s, 90s went on, more and more live-in programs stood up. And, and I could just use my example in South Central Pennsylvania. The challenges that we've had in South Central Pennsylvania is every time someone builds a new firehouse or they upgrade their station or they remodel their station, they up the quality of the bunk rooms, okay? Where, you know, when you used to have 10 
young volunteer firefighters living in one room on bunk beds. Now there's private suites and private bathrooms and all that. The challenge that we've had in central Pennsylvania is our south central Pennsylvania, our fire science program, which was one of the feeders to that, has remained stagnant and has decreased over the years. So, you know, in a place that used to have six to eight live-ins now has one or two, okay? And they're spread out. Some departments across Pennsylvania have started the concept of scheduling volunteers or stipending volunteers to commit to be able to respond uh, immediately, okay? Um, and those stipend programs, it is a more pop, it's becoming more and more popular, okay? And it's called a stipend volunteer program because again, we have to be concerned that we're not violating any wage and hour laws and things like that. They are called stipend volunteers. And there's some benchmarks that we have to make sure that they are not, you know, they're not classified as employees of anything like that, of a municipality or anything like that. Uh, and, the stipend volunteers and, and how you make sure that you don't get yourself in trouble is someone is not getting a stipend that's greater than 20% of what a paid firefighter gets paid. Okay. Uh, and, and these stipend volunteers are, uh, are given cash and they're, uh, you know, once you reach the $600 IRS threshold, they're provided with a, uh, a tax form at the end of the year by the organization. So what the vision and the goal of these stipend programs are that somebody commits to being available to respond from home or they're at the station voluntarily because you cannot, the minute you start to manage schedules and require that you gotta be in certain time, it's all voluntary, okay? It's all voluntary. Uh, this has in certain areas, uh, allowed for a rapid response time. They've allowed for a rapid response time without, you know, going through the need to hire people. Okay. Now this is one of those temporary, temporary things. You know, here's an example. I'm going to start marching down through some of these examples. Okay. But again, the goal is, is to, again, back to our previous lecture we did a few weeks ago is you're identifying that effective firefighting force, okay? And in central Pennsylvania, South Central, we have mutual aid, automatic aid companies, and our goal, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to get six firefighters out all the time. I don't need 30 or 40 or 50 coming out from my own department, okay? It's not possible. You get six trained firefighters, that's a good thing, okay? So this scheduling and stipend program, I. Uh, Again, in State College, Pennsylvania, when you join the volunteer fire department in State College, they assign you a night. You're a Tuesday night guy, you're a Wednesday night guy, you're, and that's when you go to the station and that's when you respond to calls. You know, if you wanna to go to some of the other calls, you're certainly welcome to do that, but that's how they do that. The busier Maryland and Virginia volunteer fire companies, they do the same thing. Now, again, it's an all a call volume type thing. If you're running 200 calls a year, that's not so much of a big deal because you're not going to get a lot of calls and people will get bored and tired of doing that. You know, uh, once you you're starting to get four five, six, seven calls a day, your, your, your current volunteer workforce is going to start to start to not be able to handle that amount of volume, that amount of volume. Here's an example of a stipend program, uh, that's used, um, uh, again, it's to ensure that volunteers are able to respond. Okay, um, it's not for every department. Okay, it's not for every department. You need qualified members and you need leaders to manage it. I was told by uh, one of my mentors again that he runs a program that he recommends that you have at least 50 people participating. Uh, and they, have, they started what's called an associate member program where they have people from other communities join their department because they have this staffing program that you know, the example is back in their home department, you know, they don't have time to become a member of that department. They, they have a family, they're busy, they got two jobs, they got three kids, sports, but they still want to be a volunteer firefighter. So they're going to go hang out in this other municipality and run one shift a week or one shift every two weeks. They're going to get a stipend for doing that. And, uh, 
they'll still get their enjoyment of being a firefighter. Um, again, it's a, it's a vi viable alternative, uh, but the members, uh, you know, they, they, they need to want to do it. Okay. It's a voluntary thing. So, um, you know, here's an example of a stipend program that is uh, run in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Southeastern Pennsylvania uh, in, in what they do. Um, there's there's um, three fire departments that participate in this uh, from their from their township. They're, the volunteer fire companies are responsible for staffing uh, those times, 6 p.m. To, to 6 a.m., okay? Four seats uh, in station, and that's, that's what they're given. That's their stipend right there. Uh, they also have a weekend coverage. They also do weekend coverage. Uh, and obviously you could see the name on the right there you know, um, Bill guaranteed me it's all legal. They've had all their legal people look. Did we lose Jerry? It sure seems that way. Yes, we lost Jerry. I'm texting him right now. Sorry about that. Well, while we wait for Jerry to get back, does anyone have any um, examples of what Jerry's talking about, about certain stipend programs or, uh, here he comes, um, or any success stories that work that we might be able to share with one another? As an elected official, um, I, I, I serve as an elected official, and one of the perspectives is, you know, we need to be concerned about, um, certainly from a fiscal standpoint, but, but the the lack of inaction that if we don't do something, um, you know, the, the long term, the short term costs um, certainly outweigh the most immediate cost of, of bringing some folks on board. So I, I would say that, you know, whatever programs that you're looking at, um, one of the things that obviously is to engage your, your local elected body um, right from the start to design a program, uh, you know, kind of get their buy in and really look at, at, at the forthcoming needs. One of the things that, that we've looked at um, certainly is the age of the volunteers. That you know, do we have a lot of younger folks or a lot of older folks? Well, a lot of older folks, obviously, um, you know, aren't going to be as active for as long as some of the younger folks. So, you know, whatever programs are put in place, um, you know, certainly how can they evolve, um, you know, going forward, and, and and what the cost is as well. Um, you know, I I'd rather my, my my folks in the fire department fight fires and train than you know fry chickens and and you know sell bingo tickets. You know, I think it's really what we have in there. I want the training, you know, I want the engagement, um, and working with other departments for, for regional training, as Jerry mentioned. Jerry, are you back? I see him frozen on my screen there. So while we're waiting on Jerry, this is Kevin Smith from Butler Township. Um, we have started the stipend program uh, we have probably about 30% coverage of it at this point. Um, one of the big things that we're noticing is that as we bring associates on is we really didn't figure that cost of the extra fire gear that <laughs> that would happen when we started bringing some of those on. So um, that's one thing to think of is the total cost of it as you're going into it. Sure. 
Any other guys? Creative sti stipend programs or, you know, re recruitment retention initiatives that you've done in, in your communities, whether it be uh, on the fire side or certainly from the elected official side. I know we have a couple elected officials and I'd be uh, curious to hear the, the perspective of, of those that, that are uh, helping to lead our communities as well. But hey, Jerry, welcome back, buddy. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, I had a... Uh... I had a power outage and my internet's out, so I'm connected to my cell phone. Could you hear me okay? I'm clear. Yeah, we hear you. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate that. After uh, two and a half years of uh, maybe three years of doing these uh, types of meetings and multiple meetings a day, this is the first time I've had a complete power outage from uh, my home, but I am back. Uh, thank you, John, for picking up after me. Uh, I just left off at this slide. What I do, uh, you know, again, if you are interested in something like this, uh, there's the name of the department that's doing it. Uh, Bill, Bill certainly could give you the strengths and weaknesses of a program like this. Uh, it's one of those things that, that they have career staffing during the day. Uh, they have full-time firefighters during the day, and they have their volunteers covering weekends and evenings. Again, it's just one one example of something that some someone is doing a little bit differently in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, again, it's something that, you know, uh, if it works for you, that's where it is. So what are some of the other alternatives? What are some of the other alternatives out there for, um, I'm just getting dispatched right now for wires and uh, wires and Emerge, electrical emergency complex. So I kind of figure out what's going on there. <laughs> so we're, we're good. We're good to keep I guess he has the outage again. In California? Yeah, <laughs> or Cumberland County. I, I am back. Sorry. All right, let me. Uh, some storms there, Jerry, or what? What's... Yeah, yeah, I'm back on my home internet. My, my 5G kind of started really slowing down. <laughs> so I'm back, so. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Uh, like I said, this has been a, uh, I've been doing this type, these type of programs for a couple of years now, and this is the first complete failure. So uh, there, what are the alternatives and where have you as elected officials uh, and, and uh, elected officials, managers, fire chiefs need to look at things, okay? Because there's costs and benefits to other, to all these things, strengths and weaknesses. But when you look at the bottom line there, it requires, honest, open communication between the leadership of the organization and the elected officials. And a joint plan should be developed to solve the problem, okay? Too many times I see uh, elected officials trying to do something or the fire department trying to do something and they're not, they're not coordinated in what they want to do, okay? <clears throat> you want to start to look at this um, in your organization uh, to be as proactive as possible on what, what alternatives 
If the recruitment doesn't work, if the retention doesn't work, if a stipend program doesn't work, what is happening, okay? And how are we gonna do that? Again, measuring performance before you make a decision is a critical piece of the pie here, okay? It is more than 50%, 50 to 60% of the pie by measuring your performance. The previous discussion that we had two or three weeks ago talks about that concept of an effective response force. And, you know, here is a, uh, this is a, a graphic. Uh, and again, sometimes it's hard to describe it. And I found this graphic actually yesterday in a document that was published. It's not two or three people arriving on a fire truck to make all these things happen, okay? There's multiple things that occur at a house fire. And you'll see there's an example of suburban Pennsylvania in this picture. A hose line in the front door. You've got firefighters searching for a victim above the garage. You've got firefighter going into a window to search and put the fire out. You've got firefighters standing by outside in what's called a RIT team. Uh, you've got uh, an incident commander, you've got somebody in charge, you've got someone operating the apparatus. So arriving with all these, or, uh, arriving with all these uh, pieces in a certain period of time is important, and we've already talked about that. Some places across uh, Pennsylvania and some places across the nation have uh, have decided that they need to move to something different than they currently have. And this is the uh, what they call the transition from um, an all volunteer organization as the service demands increase, okay, as the service demands increase, as the complexity increases, you're moving from an all volunteer system up uh, across that box your organizational design changes. And that's what we're gonna to finish tonight off over the next, uh, next uh, things to talk about this because I think this is a really important piece of the pie here of where you traditionally have a volunteer dominant organization. And as the complexity increases, there's more paid leadership involved in this. And I'm gonna show you several examples from Pennsylvania in how this is transitioned in certain organizations. So that transition. So how, how uh, the, the guiding document that you want to read, and I, I have a picture of it right here. I, I got it out of order, by the way, okay? The guiding document right here is called Lighting the Path of Evolution, uh, and it is the, called the Red Ribbon Report. And you could Google that and download it. It's a free document from the International Association of Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Section, okay? And that gives you the goods and, and how to do this the right way. And I feel pretty comfortable. I, I, uh, and surprisingly, this document has been out since 2005, 2005. And the concepts in this document are still relevant today uh, as they were back then. And in that document, how do you know you should change? How do you know you should change? So you'll see on the right, the picture there, that was two summers ago, and that was on a Friday, okay? And on a Friday, two summers ago, we had 52 people on that fire call. And that was in an automatic aid area and a borough that was close to where, where, uh, where I'm standing right now. And that was, everyone was a volunteer in that picture except four firefighters from a, a Navy base and there were two public safety officers there from a neighboring municipality. And those public safety officers are a combination of EMTs and firefighters. Everyone else was a volunteer. Hey, when you look at something like that, I'm saying that system's working pretty good. However, three weeks from that point in time, you could get that same house fire and you could have half of those 52 or a quarter of those 52 people show up. So how do you determine you need to change, okay? Do you have community growth, okay? Is there the community aging? Is there missed calls? Is there reduced volunteer staffing? Is there a response time concern? 
is there things like that that you need to measure and look what's happening? Is there a unit responding understaffed with two people and one of those persons is a firefighter that just completed their firefighter one last year, okay? What does that look like and how, how do we prepare for that? Okay, how do we prepare for that? So our traditional organizations, okay, when we look at our traditional organizations, some of our traditional organizations, well, I'll be honest, a lot of them are not designed as an all hazard modern public safety organization, okay? A lot of our organizational designs have not changed as the, the community has changed. We are still a membership driven organization with elected leaderships, and, and sometimes those organizations makes, you know, it takes forever to make some decisions in membership driven organizations. Now it's okay in some ways to take your time to make a decision, okay? But it also becomes the debate club whenever the hard decisions need to, make, need to be made, okay? And sometimes we never come to a consensus when those hard decisions need to be made because in all reality, if you're going to be transitioning to some sort of combination department or something different, it should be in collaboration with your volunteer fire company. It should be in cooperation with your volunteer fire company. So I'm not going to read every single one of these benefits and risks. You will get to read those when I send them out to you. But each one of these systems okay, has benefits and risks, okay? Again, an all-volunteer system, you know, um, reduced labor costs, you know, uh, volunteers willing to take off time to do some things, uh, you know, high volume staffing with major emergencies. You know, we get a major call, there's a lot of volunteers coming out, maybe. A combination system, you know, there's a combination of both volunteer and career, Maybe they're together, okay? Maybe they're uh, daylight staffing versus volunteer in the evening. All paid staffing is that consistent, predictable staffing level, okay? It's consistent and predictable. But obviously, you know, paid staffing is expensive due to what was previously labor done with volunteers uh, uh, with all the things that come with that. So in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, if you look at this, and I've been using this for several years, okay, what has been done in Pennsylvania to transition to a combination organization, okay? So you look on the left, okay, left is an all-volunteer fire company or traditional fire company, okay? And as you move forward, okay, and there's this, you can see I'm moving my line here, okay? And we have determined that, you know, things are going well, okay? Our all-volunteer fire company, we're getting out on every call. We've got firefighters trained, you know, we got a good organization going, okay? Then, then some problems need to occur and, you know, problems occur and we need to start doing some things different. So we asked the township, you know, we asked the township, uh, you know, maybe if some of those township municipal workers could, could come out on calls to help us during the day. And let's stand up a live-in program, okay? And, you know, let's do our incentivized volunteer program, as we talked about, those incentives. And, and I put that red line there because maybe we could stop right there and we're, we're golden for a couple of years, okay? You know, we're, we're, we're going out on all the calls. We got enough volunteers. There's things happening. It's good. It's a good thing, Okay. We stop, okay? Maybe we never need to go beyond the right, okay? We, maybe we never need to do any of those other type of things, okay? Um, but again, we might, you know, start to struggle. Our call volume is going up. You know, we're having more development in the township. You know, we have, uh, we have uh, you know, some, some uh, you know, and areas building up, we, you know, we, we, we do some things and maybe some local governments decide, okay, maybe the fire department needs some help. And that's called the FAO concept, the fire administrative officer. So there's two people on this call. Uh, Doug Gokenauer is one of my friends. He is the fire administrative officer. He's been with us for 22 years. 
somebody else from uh, Upper Dublin or Upper Moreland, I couldn't remember which one, it, he gave the title as a fire administrative officer. And those roles are primarily administrative. A lot of those positions have emergency management coordinator uh, duties. Uh, but that person is usually an employee of the township or local government. And they're still a volunteer fire chief. They're still volunteer fire officers. They're still dual oh, organizations or different boy. organizations. Okay? There's some places, there's some oh, places boy. in Pennsylvania that uh, have decided that the, due to the complexity, due to the complexity of what we are doing, okay, due to the complexity of what we are doing is we are, um, you know, they decide that they need to have some full-time position to lead the volunteer fire service, okay? And I'll be showing you some organizational charts uh, very, very soon on, on some places that have done that. Uh, I've seen that stood up in several areas of Pennsylvania uh, to help guide and lead. And that, again, that is a local elected officials. You know, I talked to uh, two of them uh, when, when they did this. Their goal was not to become a paid fire department. They want a professional managing and leading the volunteer fire service, okay, and collaborating because of the complexity, okay. You guys know what your fire budgets are. You know what it looks like. There are some fire companies in Pennsylvania, volunteer organizations, that have million-dollar budgets, okay, uh, and some of the townships are heavily involved in owning the apparatus, owning the stations, the complexity, complexities there. Some places have moved toward hiring paid drivers, paid, uh, paid part-time firefighters and things like that. But what I'm getting at and what I'm trying to tell, and some have gone to the full-time model. What I'm getting at to you is there's not one size, it's what you work on based on your assessment of performance, okay? An assessment of performance. Um, uh, and again, what does it look like? And how does this happen? Uh, I'm going to then focus on some of our basic organizational structures, and then we're going to talk about some examples. So one of the things that I have seen struggles with across Pennsylvania, what a, one of the struggles is, is when we have a traditional volunteer fire company, we have some, maybe somebody hired some paid staff in the past, and there's some volunteer fire companies that have hired paid drivers on their own, okay, and they report to the volunteer fire chief. You have to clearly define in your area and establish some sort of authority, okay? Um, clearly, this organization has some very good best practices in what they are doing, okay? Uh, there's clearly a chain of command, okay? There's clearly rules and regulations that are not overly overburdened, okay, and crazy, okay? A lot of places when they decide to move to hiring a paid fire chief or a director of emergency services, to do it right, you need to have authority. And that authority is through usually some sort of ordinance that establishes the authority of the township employee to manage emergency services. Also, as part of the municipal code, all the codes, there is an official recognition of the, the volunteer fire department, okay? And if you take a pretty good look at the rules and regulations for this, uh, for this department, okay, which was mutually agreed upon, which was mutually agreed upon, um, you know, here's an example again, uh, you know, clearly it states on number three, it clearly states on number four, clearly states on, you know, a, the, the volunteer fireman shall comply with approved budget procedures and follow purchasing procedures. Isn't that reasonable to do? Uh, uh, the, the volunteer fire department shall implement competency-based training as recommended by the chief. So one of the places, and again, uh, in, in some of my travels and some of the work that I do, there's some places that I walk into and I, I'm asking, well, who's in charge? And there's not a lot of people that can, well, the volunteer chief does this, the township guy does this, uh, the deputy chief does that. Uh, and, and, and again, and again, this is your choice. As the complexity increases, as the complexity increases, okay, how do you organize for the future? Okay, here's an example of a, a recommended uh, system in Western Pennsylvania, okay, a system in Western Pennsylvania 
where they have career firefighters and volunteer firefighters, okay? Now, this is the concept of unity of command under non-emergency activities, okay? We are not on an incident scene here. This is your day-to-day -day station duties, okay? This is how they decided that they wanted to be organized. They still have some volunteer officers. They still have career officers, okay? The times that you start to take a look at this, uh, again, is the complexity of what, what we have in our organization, how many people are in those positions, but they felt that this, this would work for them and, and that's how they're organizing their, their organization. Here's another organization that is a combination of paid leadership and volunteer firefighters. Paid leadership and volunteer firefighters, where you have where you have a combination of, and, and, and again, this is a large organization. This is a large organization where all of the hands-on stuff is done by volunteers, but the, the complexity of this, again, 70,000 people, uh, you know, four, three, uh, I think three or four stations, they have just stood up due to the complexity of it, another chief position. So their vision is to have a strong volunteer organization. They recently completed a study. They have performance metrics that they are following, but the study came back and said, you're doing great, okay? You've got a lot of volunteer members, okay? You need to continue with that and continue to move forward. But this is an integrated command structure. Everybody knows who they report to, okay? Everybody knows who they report to. Here's an example of unity of command for emergency incidents. Unity of command for emergency incidents. And I got this from a, a department in Lancaster County, okay? Where again, one of the key successes of a combination department is the requirements for the volunteer members and career members are the same, okay? And, and there's, there, that is a key, very important thing that if you become a volunteer line officer, you meet the exact same criteria in training requirements and performance requirements as, as a, a, a career line officer and things like that. So there's some examples of organizational structures. Can I can tell you when you talk about that transition to a career or combination system, you gotta get the organizational structure right. You got to get it right and you got to give the people leading it the proper authority to make it happen. Okay. That's a lot. That's a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of discussions on that. Um, again, we, we've seen areas across Pennsylvania that do it a little that, you know, they hire some paid people and the volunteers lead the paid people. And sometimes that works out. Sometimes it, it doesn't work out. You just got to understand what you see as the vision for, for your, your future, okay? Going to slide into the last part of today's, uh, today's lecture. We've got about a half hour left to uh, go through a couple more slides and, and then open it up for questions. Uh, I think we've survived, the, uh, survived the, the problem, but here's some examples of, of some regionalization stuff that, that I have followed uh, and, and there's, 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 there's two different things, and we'll go, uh, go from the regional concept of an emergency services commission. And this is a model similar to how they develop regional police departments in Pennsylvania, okay? There are two very successful uh, emergency services commissions in Pennsylvania, and this, this is one of them, uh, and there's another one in Lancaster County that I'll show you where the leaders in the, uh, the municipal officials developed through PA's intergovernmental cooperation law, uh, the commission model. And uh, this one, again, there's six municipalities that are involved. There's three fire companies, one provides an ambulance service. The total public dollars that go into running that is 1.7, okay? So their goal in this organizational structure is eventually they're gonna to get to some sort of regional fire department at the bottom of this screen, okay? They are not there yet. They may not get there, okay? Uh, when I worked this project, and this started in 2012, 2013, 
you had each one of those fire departments that serve pieces and parts of every one of those municipalities, the chief from each one of them going and asking for money from each one of those in an uncoordinated fashion. We, and a lot of money, uh, a lot of money for apparatus and equipment and things like that. And uh, the, the municipal officials thought it was, is there a better way? So uh, came in and, and did a lot of work with these organizations. And uh, the commission model in this example is more of an administrative commission. They are not an operations commission. You know, they don't go and tell the fire departments, you got to buy a pierce, you got to buy a this, you got to do that. They manage the funding and it is a, a coordinated budgeting process, a coordinated budgeting process. Uh, a good friend of mine I developed out of this was, uh, you know, uh, he was assigned to the task force to help decide it. And he was part of one of the townships and he's a retired, uh, retired engineer from, uh, uh, he lives in uh, Newland Township there. And he, I spent a lot of time with him, but he was the mastermind on developing the, uh, the, the agreed upon funding formula for this. So prior to this being established, one township, there was always the accusation of one township spending more than the other. So they finally agreed onto a funding formula. They had some hiccups and they had some fights, but they developed their funding formula on uh, call volume per municipality, um, um, population and property value. So to get to that 1.3 or 1.4 million that they divvy that up that way and uh you know like i said they've had some of their challenges there uh, like any intergovernmental cooperation does and i check in on them uh, every once in a while but it's a way to organize multiple emergency services that's pretty unique the next one that i think is really cool is this one in uh, lancaster county uh, i have a good friend that's the commissioner he's the only full-time employee of this They've got two townships in one borough, and this is the Lidditz area, Warwick Lidditz area. Uh, they have five volunteer fire companies and uh, three EMS agencies. They've got citizen reps on their board of directors. Now their goal is to remain strong volunteer organizations way into the future, okay? Strong volunteer organizations. They are not driving toward a paid system, okay? But they manage it, they manage it, with this uh, concept of the overarching standards of cover with, it, with administrative support, the commission with a commissioner being the lead, the leader, okay? And again, when I talk about the leader, okay, the key to success in these type of projects and the township chief model is getting the right person, getting the right person that's not, uh, you know, the, the best people for these types of positions are the ones that are competent, understanding, educated, but they don't have to be the guy out leading every fire uh, command model. They, they, they don't need to be on every call. They need to be uh, collaborative in nature. They need to understand uh, the environment. They need to understand the environment. And, and my, my friend that runs this one is, is the perfect model of this. Strategic planning, leadership, they do coordinated recruitment and retention between all of those organizations. They have a coordinated developing a regional fire police model. They have a coordinated apparatus planning and purchasing between those all those departments that all those engines are not being purchased one year and they're, they're tracking the responses on those type of things. So that that is really one uh, that, that I that uh, my uh, my friend Dwayne talks a lot about I bring them into some things. And again, these type of things require an extraordinary amount of collabor collaboration, okay? The Kennett model, it was the elected officials that are on the board. The elected officials, the fire companies report to that. The Warwick model, the Warwick model, the elected officials and the fire companies sit on the board, okay? So there's two different models to kind of, kind of take a look at. Um, let me get down through, kind of start, I'm gonna start marching through this because uh, again, we're coming coming down to the end. This is a uh, regionalization of an EMS effort in Adams County, Pennsylvania. Uh, this used to be two different volunteer fi or fire companies that ran the ambulance service. They were volunteer, they did have paid ambulance employees. Um, they cover a 21 of the 34 municipalities in Adams County. Okay, they're a 501c3, they're run on a board of directors. 
they've got some key people on their board of directors. They've got a county commissioner on their board of directors. They have an HR director from the local health system. As they have gotten more mature, uh, they've taken on more service area and, and things like that. $2.9 million budget, about 7,000 calls, okay? Now, again, uh, you know, they, they are, they are uh, and, and they do receive funding from every one of those municipalities. They do receive funding from every one of those municipalities to keep the organization moving forward. Uh, again, digging a little bit deeper into those, you know, I encourage you, if you're interested in those things, to contact people from those organizations. This is a pretty cool regionalization effort in the Poconos. This organization on their board of directors has uh, elected officials from every one of their municipalities, okay? Um, their municipalities each have some an EMS tax uh, and they do bring in funds from the municipalities and from uh, typical EMS uh, um, billing and, and memberships and things like that. They're running about 6,000 calls, uh, six, 7,000 calls a year. Um, it's a regional effort, uh, a lot of community effort involved in, in this. I can speak to that. And, and, and Jerry, thanks. That I was manager of Toby Anna Township, and it, it works very well. There were some hiccups in the beginning, but the call volume is increasing. And in fact, one of the things that the communities have, have rallied together, for example, um, 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 uh, you know, purchases that, that are made in bulk, like bulk fuel and, and um, you know, bulk equipment that we're able to provide um, worked very well. And the call volume is just increasing uh, tremendously. But in each of the municipalities, they, there, there's money that's budgeted. And as Jerry had mentioned, there's a, there, there's a representative and a board member from each of the, each of the local governments. Um, there's also a police effort that covers the same area um, and uh, a growing effort to do some fire as well. Great example. Thanks, Jerry. Excellent. And, and this one is another, another model that I like to use. Uh, this started with two, two boroughs, five miles apart. And, and today, you know, they used to have each one of those stations had like six vehicles in each station. Okay. Um, they really, as this regionalization effort, you know, people get all worked up when you talk about regionalization. We're, we're going to close stations. We're going to close stations. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. These guys, uh, these guys did it much better. Okay. They, uh, they were able to right size the organization as it grew. So they started as two, two boroughs that came together. Um, and then by 2019, two other municipal fire departments, volunteer fire departments, one in Bonneville and, and one in Hampton, T-O-N, decided to join and be part of this. Okay. Um, like I said, each one of those stations used to have like six vehicles in each, in each station. They right-sized the fleet where they have a central station that has an engine, a ladder truck, and a heavy rescue. And then those other stations have <coughs> a pumper tanker and a, uh, a pickup truck. They used to have four separate insurance policies. They used to have so much duplication of service. Now, every one of those municipalities does contribute to the organization. It is an all, it is still currently all volunteer, okay, with a 900K budget. Now, I did hear from my, uh, my friend who is uh, the chief there. He's, this is his last term as chief. He's been there for 10 years. They are putting in a safer grant to get some daytime staffing in um, for that organization due, due, to, uh, due to their volumes and, and things like that. So that is an example of a, of a regionalization effort in Adams County. And this started from the fire service end, okay? The fire service was the one that, what, uh, what, what, what really, uh, really uh, pushed that. This is another one that, that is a regionalization that I call an operational regionalization. Obviously, when you look at those organizations, they are separate organizations. Uh, they, they remain separate organizations. I don't think there's a vision to bring them together, but they have agreed, the leaderships in each one of those organizations have agreed on standard operating guidelines, agreed to common safety guidelines, rescue guidelines, and, and they train on a regular basis uh, I had uh, some of the people from those organizations do a study or a, do a, uh, a webinar for me a couple of years ago, and it's really unique. And, and what is really good about it is it's the best of all the worlds. They're, they are truly collaborating together, okay, because they want to and they understand the reason behind it. So, uh, 
again, we could see some good things. There's some, some of this bubbling out in, in some other areas in Western Pennsylvania, but not to the extent of this, where they, they, they use this, they run it, they, they run, this, uh, run those policies and guidelines on a regular basis, and, and, and it works well. So I do have uh, you know, a whole uh, series of examples that I'm gonna go through quickly, uh, but I'm gonna leave the last 15 minutes for, for open discussion as we finish it up. You know, and, and you'll be able to, to check into these on your own. This is in, uh, this is in Washington County. Um, uh, this is a combination fire department that originally started as a all volunteer organization. They had staffing issues, some concerns. They've got a career chief and a career deputy. And they do have on-duty staffing of three full-time firefighters, three full-time firefighters with volunteers, um, with volunteers in the evenings, weekends, and during the daylight, and during the daylight. And they still have volunteers that come from home. Population of about 14,000 and 27 square miles. They have three stations. They just built a brand new station. They're building another one. Their budget's about $1.8 million uh, to do that. Um, here's, a, here's again, I, uh, this was a, another fire department uh, out West. They used to be two departments developed into one or three, it used to be two departments in four municipalities. Uh, they, they did their own consolidation. Uh, they're, they're now in the process of building a new station. They're um, building a new station. West Manchester, this has the career fire chief model. This is south of where I am in, in York County. They've had a career chief for about 25 years, okay? Uh, their vision of their elected officials, when I talk to this chief, is to remain a strong volunteer department. The very interesting piece of this one is the volunteer department a couple of years ago voted to eliminate the election process, okay? And that they have a professional selection process for their line officers, which I think that is a very good thing. I'm a huge fan of that because we know, and, and some people that I've worked with over the years, uh, you know, you get the wrong fire chief in there, the wrong person that personality uh, conflicts with an elected official or conflicts with the manager, things don't go well. And it's a rocky relationship. So uh, this is, uh, you know, see the budget of that organization. Uh, this is out in, uh, this is another organization that's growing, doing a lot of different things out in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, I, had a, I had a chance to uh, teach a class there a couple of years ago and was pretty impressed how they're doing some things. They do have career staff uh, and volunteers leaning more toward career. They still are going to, they, stipe, they have a stipend volunteer program. Um, they're building some new stations right now. Uh, and, and again, it just, sounded like they were organized. And, and uh, one of the things that the volunteer chief told me is they got the organizational structure correct. They got the organizational structure correct. They still have a volunteer chief, but the deputy chief is full-time career and that uh, the deputy chief manages the career staff and things like that. Uh, again, here's another uh, that uh, another in our, in our Harrisburg area, it used to be five separate, or used to be five se or six separate volunteer fire companies. Uh, they all came together uh, under a township chief. There's still four volunteer fire companies, but they they have they follow the township SOGs, and uh, they've had some bumps and bruises over the years, like like some have. But uh, they've got an apparatus replacement plan together. They've got uh, they've got people. They have a formal recruitment program together. A formal retention program together um, and, and, and things like that. So um, what I do wanna open it up for is any type of feedback and discussions and comments that many of you may have, okay? So uh, I know I went a little fast through a lot of those things. I, I will make myself available um, for, again, I, again, we did hopefully this, the recording didn't get messed up too much when the thing stopped. But what I will do is I will send you these, um, send you these, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint and uh, the PowerPoint, you know, all those examples on there. I know most of those people personally in those organizations, and they're always, they're always available to tell you the strengths, the weaknesses, the bumps in the road and how you move forward. So with that, I'll uh, turn it to John, if you wanna, if anybody has questions and any other discussion they'd like.
any thoughts or comments on you know from anybody of uh, you know the fireside or you know elected official commissioners? Yeah, comment <clears throat> regarding cost to apparatus and the municipalities. It seems like it wasn't included unless it was included with the regionalization concept that the expense of the apparatus is so high rather than all these fire departments thinking, well, we need to have this, this, and this for our municipality to where the municipal leaders get together and say, okay, <clears throat> we'll, 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 we'll be purchasing this so that you can use this because not everybody, because at one time you may need an articulating arm, you may need a tower platform, you may need an aerial ladder, you, <clears throat> you may need a squirt, you may need a snozzle. All these different specialty pieces all have a terrific price tag with them. Has there been any thought process with the municipal leaders getting together and knowing that type of concept also? There, there, the first of all, the only structure in place that I know that is currently working on that is that Kennett regional model where they, um, they put together a joint apparatus replacement plan. Okay. That I, they're looking at it um from that six municipality level and again there's only three departments underneath that your concept is very valid and it makes perfect sense um but it, it again it, it was mentioned when we first started this last the last program uh, i know dave hall mentioned that is again the cost of the apparatus will continue to go up and there should be some type of coordination but there's got to be some sort of, of some sort of uh, plan in place or people collaborating to do that. It makes perfect sense. It really does. Other questions that anybody has? Yeah, I'll go with another question. Sure. <clears throat> and that is, we saw what happened to our departments with uh, the COVID lockdowns and stuff to where we, you know, from a volunteer aspect, we had to push members away, not to have them come to the station to risk infecting a the whole body to go to uh, staffing issues and such. Has anybody seen a response or uh, whether it was positive membership being coming back in or is it stayed negative? to where um, with you know, young people just not wanting to join a volunteer organization. I will go back to if, if you have a vision and if you have a motivation to recruit members and have a good process to do that, and if you have some retention incentives, if the organizational culture wants more volunteers and you have the catchment area. So, the other piece that I didn't mention very well is, you know, if you're in a municipality that has three different fire companies and they're doing nothing together, they're all fighting for the same members, okay? Just like they're fighting for the same dollars um, and, and the same fundraising dollars if they still do that. But I do think that uh, if an organization, and I've seen, I've seen places across PA, they're doing a very good job at bringing in new members. And <laughs> some are rural, <laughs> some are rural Pennsylvania, some are suburban Pennsylvania. Um, but it's, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of negativity in the fact that people are throwing in the towel and saying, we just can't do this anymore and hire people. Now, maybe some places that's what the vision wants to go, but vo hire, uh, a volunteer recruitment retention program is, it's hard. It's hard to do. It is not easy to do, but I have seen positivity in, in that. Um, but it's got to be sustained. It's got to be sustained. Got a question. Uh, we see a lot of uh, cases where you'll, you'll get the younger guys and then as he, you know, he comes in at 16, 18 as a junior member or makes it to senior. And next thing you know, he takes that walk down the aisle with the bride and the family starts. And that's where you start to see, you see him fading off. Um, and I, and I can understand it. I mean, it, it, it no, it's, it's a, been around a long time and uh, the days of um, 
dad working and, and mom taking care of the kids in the house are gone. Now it takes almost two salaries to survive. And I think a lot of times too, that people are spending more time with their kids. I mean, there's a lot of bad influences out there with drugs and things. So I think that's the competition we're, we're dealing with a lot. But uh, somebody simple. mentioned something about gear earlier. And I know uh, there's a chief here in, in, in Delaware County who uh, he actually had to put his foot down because he had guys that were traveling, were running with six different fire companies. And, he, he, you know, he said, the gear's getting expensive. You know, you, you either you're either with us or you're not with us. You know, that type of a thing they had to do. And I know we ran into that here with uh, with some of our paid guys, where career guys, where, uh, they, you know, they're with you for a couple of years. And next thing you know, maybe there's a job that pays more and then they move on. So, and the gear gets pretty, pretty expensive. It's not like the old days. So that's some of the things we see here. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ray, for that. And, you know, again, I vision envision a different way of volunteering that, you know, you know, an example, I volunteer for a place in our area called New Hope Ministries, and that's a food bank. And I volunteer from 8 a.m. to 12 noon, the first Saturday of every month, except when it's a holiday. And I know that my wife and I go to that and we do that. And that's built into our schedule. You know, the modern volunteer firefighter may want to do the same thing where they will schedule a shift at the station and they will do it from this point to this point. But our organizations have to be able to want that or accept that, or there needs to be a call volume to, to do that. Okay. You know, even, even a department's running 750 calls a year, you're not getting, you know, you might go to the station for, for a 12 hour shift and get maybe no calls whatsoever. People want to run calls, you know, so that's, that's kind of like, what are we going to do? What's the new method of volunteering and how that happens? And the other, the other thing, you know, I still see, uh, you know, when, when we hit the seven, I, I, you know, I started out in the sixties, we hit the seventies, it became the, the time when everybody's buying all, adding all kinds of pieces of apparatus. But I, I, I guess I have a little bit of a problem with, you know, today when we have a call, you know, at one time, I remember the days when your, 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 your one town fire company handled the call today. You don't do that. Now you've got maybe five or six companies coming in, but they're each coming in with a piece, you know, not the entire company. However, there's still a lot of trucks out there that, that aren't turning wheels, you know, and, and I was a critic of that back in the nineties and God, they wanted to run me out of the rail because, on a rail because I didn't want to, I, I, I wouldn't take the borough uh, to debt for a, for a truck that, it, you know, to replace a truck that had an 85% scratch rate on calls it was due on, you know, and, and it, it, it's like the, the, you need to you need some management in there somewhere. You know what I mean? It's just, it's and crazy. Again, that, and, and Ray, that's why I really think it, it, it begs that, you know, community leaders um, really look at, you know, how in our communities, three townships and a borough, I mean, what's the call volume collectively? Where do we need a ladder truck? Where do we need a heavy rescue? Where yeah. do we need, whatever it would be, um, because as elected officials, we need to do a better job, I think, of talking to one another in the neighboring municipalities and say, hey, yeah. look, let's, let's take this through, because at the end of the day, it's a taxpayer money that's going to be, as you said, borrowed or you know they go out to get a loan for a million five for a ladder whatever it is um and and those costs aren't going down so we need to initiate those discussions now yeah well now one, one of the things we are seeing in delaware county is we're we're we're, we're a product of a merger back about geez maybe 15 years ago i guess so now we only have two stations in in, in the township us in philadelphia engine 78 at the airport <laughs> but anyway we, we, you know, we're a product of merger. I know the Marcus Hook guys down there, they're merged about three companies. Um, Upper Chichester just merged three companies. So you're seeing a lot. And, I mean, and it's not, I, you know, it's, uh, it probably makes sense. I mean, it's cutting down on some of the cost. I mean, basically, you know, what you paid in for apparatus, you're now paying for either stipends or salaries. But um, it's, you know, do, do we really need a lot of this apparatus that we have? I, I just... It, Try, try, I don't know. It just, I wonder. You, you got it. And uh, that, that is, it's going to be a public, it's going to be a policy decision by the elected yeah. officials. But again, in, so there's two models in Pennsylvania. There's one model 
where the elected officials, the municipality purchases and owns the apparatus, okay? And then the other model is the, uh, well, there's three models. And then the other model is, the second model is the municipality gives the money to the fire company and they purchase the apparatus, okay? They purchase the apparatus. Or uh, a fire company will purchase an apparatus and use three sources of funding to buy it. Number one source of funding is uh, probably a loan from the Office of the State Fire Commissioner. Number two is company funds from fundraising and stuff they've saved for years. And number three, maybe the municipality will give them a contribution, you know, a one-time contribution, and, and then who owns that piece of apparatus. And, uh, you know, those are the three things that I see most common, uh, common about that. And, um, uh, and I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, that, that I think that public policy, the elected officials deciding, okay, you know, what do we need and, and how we determine that it's based on that effective response force discussion that I talked about in, in the first series that we did. Okay. That concept of four engines, a heavy rescue and a truck on, on a first alarm. Uh, and, and, and what, you know, because there's probably places where we can get by with, you know, maybe out of four, three fire companies, everybody gets an engine. You have a spare between all four of them, a spare engine when one breaks and then one, one ladder truck and a spare and a, a heavy rescue and a couple of pickup trucks. But again, that's, again, uh, in my travels, when I had my previous position, I, I, when I worked in New England, when I worked out West, much different thing, much, much, much different, uh, much different way of organizing. We, we in, in, here in, in, in Tinica, we actually, well, actually, we, you know, one time there was, there was four engines, there was two rescue trucks and we're down now to two engines and, and one, one basically is a backup or, or our I-95 piece. That's an old engine we take out on I-95, but sooner or later it's going to get whacked. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we, we hold on to that, but uh, we, we, we have a large station, but and, I, and, I, and if somebody would ride by, they would say, well, gee, look at the size of your firehouse. And that's true, but we also have boats and everything else because we're right on the river and all. So, as a matter of fact, the, the one side of it's, uh, it looks like a boathouse over there with the, with the boat trailers. Plus the state police, um, a Marine unit works out of here. So that's another thing. But, but anyway, yeah, it's, it, it, <clears throat> we cut down on the apparatus. One thing I will say though, with, with, with the other companies coming in and, and, and like a box, it, 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 Delaware County is almost working like a, uh, like a county department. I mean, basically when an assignment goes out, you got an engine coming from there, a truck coming from there, different pieces, a writ coming from somewhere else. But what I've seen in that over the years is that the companies basically work better now together than they did years ago, only because now they're used to, they're, now they're getting used to working together and it's a much more efficient uh, than it was years ago, you know? So I do, I do see that. And we just had a, a, a job on uh, Saturday the same way and every day, you know, it just, uh, there's, you don't see the, uh, you don't see the, uh, the competition or the battle or the arguments like you used to see years ago. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I, I agree with you and I've seen the same thing in my area too. Yeah, same, the same good things, yeah. which I think is great. I think I really do. I think it's great. Yeah. All right, guys. I think we're going to wrap it up. If nobody else has any questions, just one uh, other comment, Jerome, and that is, yes. I agree with you. The only thing that we can't schedule are incidents. So we have to do a better job at uh, drawing our members in, give them that option, especially for the two income survivors for, you know, buying a home and having a family. Absolutely. Keith, where are you from again? Uh, Springfield in Delaware County. Okay. All right. I'm not sure if I've been down there before or not, but uh, thanks Ray's for coming. been there. What's that? Yes, every uh, once, once, a, once, a, what, the second uh, Thursday on uh, in the month <laughs> for a meeting. All right, guys. Uh, thank you. If no, thanks nobody for has time. anything else. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thanks for your service. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening.